The sunlight is streaming through my office, so much so that I don't even bother turning the lab lights on. I'm 22 years old, and I'm sitting in my office on a summer holiday, the day before the 4th of July, and I am loving it. This is like ultimate academic fantasy for me. I've waited my whole life for this. I'm drinking coffee. There's beach noises outside in this little seaside science town. And I am maybe thinking about science, maybe screwing around on the internet, and I'm all by myself in the lab with the lights off. Suddenly, I hear the door open, and I hear Claire, my office mate, and Camilla, another grad student, come in. And I hear them say, I heard she stole him from Aaron, and I know immediately they're talking about me. And they have no idea that I am in there, because <laughs> they still have to walk the rest of the lab to get to my office. So I put on my best smirk and roll over in my chair looking at the doorway. And they come in, they gasp. Claire goes, oh, I have to grab something from my office. And she grabs it, and they run outside immediately, like full pace running, 25-year-olds. 25-year-old <laughs> women, supposedly. And so I'm just thinking there, like, what am I, what am I going to do next? And then they come rushing back in, and they decide to sit down and have an adult conversation where they, they apologize to me about gossiping about me, and, you know, there's all these rumors going around, and I, I feel very mature in this moment, because not only have I caught them gossiping about me, but we are going to have an adult conversation where we make it all better, and we're all going to be better friends for it, right? And what had happened is that this guy, Jack, who'd been in this long distance relationship with this Canadian and been slowly untangling in it. And there were all these young women sitting around like vultures waiting for him to finally be free. And I had just waltzed in a month, uh, a month ago, new to the school. And he was cute. I had asked around if he was single. I specifically asked Erin because she hung out with him all the time. Are you guys dating? And I had gotten a firm no. So we started dating. But suddenly, all these young women hated me, hated me because I had stolen him somehow from Aaron and them. And so I explained to Claire and Camilla that I didn't steal anything. He was absolutely single. And I really thought it would be OK. But actually, everything got way, way worse. Apparently, the whole incident made Claire feel so bad about herself that she hated being around me. And the, few, <laughs> and the few close friends that I had made, she also was close with. And she had been planning this weekend to go to her family's cabin in Maine. And she decided to invite all of them and not me, because it was too stressful for her, despite the fact that I was the one that had caught her gossiping about me. But she didn't have very good vision. And we shared a very tiny office, like six by six feet. Like, it was a very tiny office. And so she would have her email up in like size 24 font. <laughs> and one afternoon, she left the email invite open to her weekend getaway that I was specifically not invited to up for hours all afternoon while she went and did something. <laughs> and I could see it all day. You know, I just had to turn over my shoulder and I saw it. And it was really. It was really kind of hurtful, and, and Camilla, who I thought maybe we would become close friends with, sort of became my friend of me. And things with Jack did not work out. Turned out he was actually a bit of a jackass. <laughs> and he actually started dating someone before telling me that we were not dating anymore. So he started dating her sometime between one of the two last times we slept together. And I thought this would garner some support among these other women who were not clearly getting laid enough. And they were like, not, you know, I was still this terrible, terrible person. So I started hanging out with guys. I'd always hung out with guys as a, as a girl. I was a tomboy. And there was this crew I called the J Team, these three guys, because all their names began with J. It was like Jeremy, Jackson, and John. And we would have pretty often what we called inappropriate coffee where we would, we would go to the coffee shop where all of our bosses and everyone in this science town would go to get coffee. And it was almost like a dare when we were in the middle of an inappropriate joke to keep going if we saw someone we worked with or worked for. We dropped a lot of Arrested Development jokes um, pretty frequently. But then 
Camilla says to me one day, she goes, you know, everyone is saying that you're sleeping with all three of them at the same time. And I was like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> but I was like, really? Like, why, why would people think that about me, Camilla? Like, I honestly did not understand this at all. And she's like, well, face it, Skylar. Everyone thinks that you get around. You just come off that way. And that is not something I had ever heard in my entire life, not in high school, not in college. In high school, I had a friend laugh in my face when I had told him I'd lost my virginity. I was that kind of person. <laughs> but then I, I started thinking about it, and you know, I had grown up Unitarian Universalists, where I went to sex ed classes. I spent my summers working on tall ships with sailors, um, and most of the things that we talked about were boats and sex, and it was just you know, natural part of conversation in college that was a normal thing to talk about. Um, and one of the first weekends that I had arrived at this seaside science town, we were on a dock drinking, because that was a very common practice at five o'clock there, and I had noticed that one of the tall ships that I had worked on um, as a teenager was on the dock, and I was like, oh, I said very casually, I'm like, oh, I've had sex on that boat. It's a great boat. <laughs> and people didn't seem to care, but it suddenly dawned on me the longer I spent there that the people I were talking to were people who probably didn't have sex in high school, they probably didn't have sex in, in college, and maybe they were having sex in grad school, although it didn't seem like it to me. They're very competitive, <laughs> very nerdy, and there were clearly not enough guys to go around. So I must have seemed like a total like cougar. And <laughs> I was going to steal every available guy that was around. And I really, I internalized this shame. Part of it was this grad school is just such a grueling place where you're told you're not smart pretty much every day. <laughs> um, and and so what I decided to do is throw myself into sports, and I decided to start doing Muay Thai kickboxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, basically like MMA wrestling. And I found this gym, and I was probably the only person with a science degree, um, and there were all sorts of backgrounds and types of people, but we all came together to really work on these sports together and train together. And we, everyone was so supportive, and all we cared about were doing these sports. And I trained six days a week, two to three hours a day, and my off day was like hot yoga on Sundays for an hour and a half. That was the trimmest I'd ever been in my life, actually. And I found out that one guy in my program did judo and also liked kickboxing, and I lived in the dilapidated student dorms, and he actually had a house uh, that he shared with roommates in a garage. So we bought a heavy bag to practice on, and we hung it up in his garage. And sometimes we would go over there and practice together, and sometimes I would just go by myself. And so rumors started to spread rapidly that I was also sleeping with him. So I was a very, very busy woman in an imaginative <laughs> world. So after 12 months of not having any sex, <laughs> despite all the rumors, it's very ironic, I finally decided to say, I was like, I'm 23 years old, I should be dating, I should be having sex. And I go on to the dating website at the time, it was very popular, OkCupid. Um, and I felt okay about this because a couple of my other female friends that were struggling and looking for greener pastures as well were also doing this. And I think it was the day before Halloween, I went on a date in a coffee shop with this guy, Corey. And he was a sailor, of course, and he smelled like wood varnish and mildew. Uh, which is actually kind of an okay smell. And he wore uh, fisherman knit sweaters and had a chin strap beard and wore like one of those newsy hats. And he had these beautiful blue eyes. And he had escaped on his wooden boat all the way from Maryland from a relationship, which was a really big red flag, but when you're wearing rose colored glasses, it just looks like flags. <laughs> and. <laughs> But I, I didn't care because he had nothing to do with this social network that I was part of at grad school. He was my escape. And it turned out I was his escape from his boat during the winter. 
It's a common thing where sailors will find someone to shack up with for the winter because it's too cold to sleep on the boat, which I found out that winter. <laughs> and he told me in the early spring, we were sitting on his boat, it was finally warm enough to spend some time there, um, that he would be continuing on his course come June to Maine where he owns some property. And I was completely devastated. I'd convinced myself that I really liked this guy, which in retrospect was not true at all. <laughs> what I was really jealous of was that he got to leave this godforsaken social circle that I was so entrenched in because I was still a student. He got to escape to the land of rocky coastlines and pine trees and fisherman net sweaters and dog ownership and, <laughs> and wood stoves and everything else that I imagined my life could be if I just went to Maine. And so I left my program and I found another one in Maine. And everyone thought I was idiotic for leaving this prestigious program, that it would be a terrible idea. And on one front, they were right. Corey and I did not last. It was a total sham. But he was just my ticket to get to Maine anyway. And my first summer there, I'm at this tiny little marine station. And there are only five other graduate student women there. And upon entering, they open me with welcome arms. We go scuba diving together, we talk about science, we talk about life, all our mess-ups, relationships, sex, whatever. And I remember this one particular afternoon, um, we were watching the sunset on this pond, and there was a dock you could go swim out to, so we swam out there with a bottle of wine, and we just sat there for at least two or three hours just talking about our fears, our loves, our mistakes, just totally basking in our love of being out there in Maine together, totally bonding. I felt like I could breathe again and that I'd finally come to a place where I could be a scientist and be a person at the same time. But I still had my J team back in that seaside science town and a few other friends that had stayed for a few years, so I would go back and visit. John in particular threw the best parties in his basement. And I was at this bar with Camilla and a bunch of other people drinking and throwing darts. It was the dive bar of the town. And uh, my boxing friend that I'd bought that heavy bag with, he'd sort of stopped talking to me. And, uh, and I was like, this is weird. And I said to Camilla, I was like, he's acting like we had slept together or something. And now he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And she goes, well, didn't you sleep with him? And I look at her, and I can feel like the tinges of this gossip monster that, that lives in this town entering into me. And I smile, and I look at her, and I go, no, but I know for a fact that you did. Thank you. 